hello everyone. Welcome to this wonderful lecture session from the Horror Program at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes. I'm head of the Horror Program, which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. So we're going to be investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. The University of the Underground is a free, pluralistic and transnational university, which was founded in 2017 and birthed in the basements of nightlife venues. So we're non-profit, we're a registered charity. If you'd like to donate, please visit universityoftheunderground.org. On this website, you can find other exciting programming times and events. Um, and I'm super excited because we have Nadine Baker with us today, who's an editor and curator at large, as well as an artist and poet who works with design research and narrative craft. She's worked with DAM, Design Academy Eindhoven, the Van Arbe Museum, Design in Darbe, Cape Town uh, Partnership and the Mail and Guard. Her writing has been published by the Financial Times, Metropolis, Dirty Furniture, Call 77, Design Observer, Frame, Mark, Design and Confused, Cool Hunting, Stylus and Art Africa. This is like the, the best list uh, <laughs> ever. Um, so as well as both national newspapers and niche publications in South Africa. So she's also contributed to a variety of books and catalogues and is a co-founder of the Dutch Institute of Food and Design. So Nadine, thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any slides that you want to share, um, over to you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to try to share my screen, if you can see that. Um, okay, I'm start. Um, so now I can't really see you guys. I'm going to have to rely on you being able to see me and hear me and maybe send me a message, I guess, if you can't. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to uh, share my work with you. And um, as I said, I'm Nadine Huerta. Um, I'm here to, that's my name, uh, talk to you about the end. I don't know if anybody got the chance to watch my film before the talk, but if not, there's going to be some excerpts in the talk and you can also watch it later. Um, Hollywood has trained us to think of the end of the world as a literal end of the planet, often entailing zombies. And, but the end of the world might just be the end of an world, not the world, and the end of a reality. Certainly when it happens, <laughs> No one is expecting it. Um, where were you 23 months ago? Can you believe it's almost two years? And who would have thought that a world would be ending um, and that it would have been fought with memes, pajamas, and toilet paper? Two years on, it doesn't even feel like it's a new world. It's become a new normal that has just been, become continuous with what came before. And just as I was trying to make sense of it myself, I found myself on a speed date with Amsterdam skin infection specialist Henry de Vries, courtesy of the BioArt and Design Awards, which was an initiative here in the Netherlands, teaming up artists and scientists to do collaborative projects. Um, Henry is a specialist in infectious diseases based in Amsterdam at the Geer Deer, which is the public health service here in the Netherlands. In particular, his work focuses on sexually transmitted diseases, skin infections and leprosy, and we immediately hit it off because we found an affinity. Both of us were really motivated in wanting to understand the political and colonial dimensions of our fields. Um, after our speed date, we started having more regular conversations and what was particularly striking in his research was that despite um, significant improvements in medical treatment, um, one of the biggest hurdles that remained in treating disease was the social and cultural stigmas that prevent testing, treatment, care, and recovery. In fact, as we in fact, as we observed the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, and an entirely new set of social and cultural stigmas emerge, it struck us that stigma and fear is an inherent feature in the way that epidemiology works. There is, of course, the topic of Susan Sontag's famous book, Illness as Metaphor. 
in which she talks about how the language of war, which we use to talk about disease and fight disease and um, uh, you know, protect ourselves, impacts the people in recovery and impacts how we relate to uh, these microorganisms. The language goes beyond stigmatizing people to also the, stigmatize the microorganisms and the macroorganisms we share the planet with. Take viruses. There are quadrillions of them on Earth, yet only less than 300 impact humans. And probably you, like me, thought that maybe you think that not all bacteria is bad, we should eat our probiotics, our microbiome is actually pretty good, um, but uh, all viruses are bad. But of the quadrillions of viruses, if only the significant majority are actually viruses of bacteria. And without them, our microbiome grows so huge that it would overwhelm us and, um, and cure us. So we're in a relationship with, with, with viruses. Uh, so a distinct case of not all viruses. And when we talk, tend to talk about disease, viruses, and so on, there's always a kind of sense of all viruses or all bacteria being, being dangerous. Um, most often, when viruses do become threatening for humans, it's through zoonosis, which is when viruses from an animal um, transfer to humans. And we, here we tend to blame animals uh, rather than the violent exploitative interaction that the current human paradigm of modernity coloniality has with other species. What has this all got to do with zombies? But I don't know about zombies, Doctor. Just what is a zombie? It's both alive and dead. Well, not only are viruses in cells considered zombie or undead organisms, they're alive and dead, or neither alive nor dead, depending on who you speak to, and widely feared, but virus outbreaks have become mythologized as zombie outbreaks. Along with familiarizing myself with Henry's research in the beginning of the 2020 lockdown, I also spent a large amount of time watching all of the pandemic movies that were being promoted at that time. And it really struck me, why are all of these movies zombie movies? Where does this come from? Partly, according to Dahlia Schweitzer, uh, because of the so-called outbreak narrative, um, funded by the Center for Disease Control in the United States and codified in the 1995 movie Outbreak, I'm not sure if any of you guys remember that movie with Dustin Hoffman in it being in his hazmat suit with a little monkey and uh, I think they oh and here Minky Virginia uh, Gooding Jr. steal a helicopter and um, there's no zombies in it but that narrative is basically being extracted and placed onto zombie movies which has become the dominant zombie movie narrative over the past two decades um, and in this now to their sort of six key thematic tropes. Firstly, the creation of an other that uh, is, needs to be stigmatized and, um, and feared, whether it is an individual, a virus, a jet lifestyle, or, or whatever. Um, the, sorry, first, the idea of the necessary accident. So no matter what we do, no matter how much lockdown we have, no matter how many hazmat suits we have, something is going to get through the, the, these accidents. Um, and then this creation of the other, and then the thirdly, the, the policing, the violent militaristic policing of this othering. And in contrast to that other, then a, an us created, and so a community sense of connection created in contrast to the other. And fifth, a constant emphasis on making the invisible visible through maps, uh, microscopes, something, and creating this impending sense that there's something that we can't see that is threatening us. And um, so this constant sense of there's something more to reality than what we, that meets the eye. And then finally, the fear of progress, of which globalization is one of the most dominant tropes. Some of you might also remember that the CDC published a graphic novel for how to prepare for the zombie apocalypse as a kind of zany move in public health. But, I mean, we have to ask why the CDC is funding zombie movies to promote public health. And, I mean, Dahlia um, goes more into this, but in short, by drumming up fear, they get more funding. Um, since then, we really see this outbreak narrative kind of taking over zombie movies and what the entertainment industry calls peak zombie. That is, zombies is the biggest money-making story in Hollywood. 
um, I can't help wondering how the dominance of these narratives and you know certain events happening and a certain sequence of things um, happening after each other kind of codifies as a kind of mental virus that we think that if this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Paul Zak has done research into the neuroscience of stories and says that our brain develops an oxytocin response to certain narratives. And if we see a certain narrative emerging, then our brain will automatically um, complete the dots if we have set it up a couple of times before. And I can't help wondering if this is also some of the conspiracy thinking that happens in COVID-19 where people see similar aspects to some of these movies coming up. There's got to be a big baddie, a Bill Gates or whatever, and then there's got to be a secret twist with a hero played by Brad Pitt that, that comes to uncover it. And of course, the government can never be trusted, which may very well be true. The link between zombies and disease goes further back though. Um, the zombie figure actually originates in Haitian folklore. Uh, on the slave ships, it's a story of soul capture that mythologizes what happens when a person is enslaved. And uh, also mythologizes the Haitian slave rebellion in various ways, as explored by Sarah um, Lauro in the Transatlantic Zombie. However, in the early 20th century, the zombie story was poached by Hollywood and used again to kind of create these plantation narratives of um, uh, sort of voodoo infected um, uh, non-white people that were spreading infection and therefore had to be feared and othered, which kind of resonates with this kind of colonial legacy of epidemiology. Um, historically, the transatlantic slave ships were ridden with disease and sometimes ships would arrive with an entire, everybody either dead or infected. Traditional medicine provided by herbalists was often what helped enslaved people to survive, which ironically the colonialists um, saw as fearsome dark magic and had to violently repress. Um, incidentally, this kind of um, voodoo, emancipatory voodoo zombies re-emerging re in recent films such as Atlantiques and Zombie Child. Since those early movies, the zombie has evolved from enslaved victim to flesh-eating, brainless, and insatiably out of control, devouring monsters. Colonial mythology of a soulless human being controlled by someone or something else has evolved beyond the racial origins to tell of our existential fears of being controlled by technology, capitalism, globalization. And increasingly, it is not only the racial other that it represents, the zombie represents who or whatever your other is. Um, and through this sort of zombie tar brush, we all become someone's other, we all become zombies. Perhaps this is also significant of late capitalism as a rampant appropriation machine. Whatever resistance rises up, capitalism turns around and sells it back to us. And in this sense, as Loros, Sarah Loro so impactfully points out, the zombie is emblematic of the modern horror of America. It is a colonial resistance icon in Haitian slave rebellion that is then Hollywoodified and sold back as universal pain with complete historical amnesia of the specific colonial origins and people who are suffering, um, which is so emblematic, emblematic of American and global colonial denial, a kind of all lives matter. So in my own work, um, the Orders of the Undead is motivated to go beyond the contemporary six zombie pandemic traits that Schweitzer identified to re-emphasize that they are all conditions of colonial tropes and how the undead colonial ideas or orders continue to live on and spread like mind virus, viruses through our Hollywood zombie mythologies. The four episodes of the film that I created that was installed at the Mu um, Hybrid Art House in Eindhoven are the end, the division, the calculation, wake. Why do I start at the end? Uh, the end of the world is the main character in uh, contemporary zombie flicks, which are a race against the clock to either prevent the end, as in World War Z, or to rebuild post-end, as in The Walking Dead. And similarly, at the moment, between COVID-19 and the environmental disaster, there is this impending apocalypse that feels like it's just in our reality. Um, but 
for colonized peoples and countries, the end started some 500 years ago, and we are quite deeply into the end already. What the end of the world does in a narrative is to create the state of exception and urgency so overwhelming that anything becomes allowable. And in this state of exception, dehumanizing serves to warrant horrific violence, both physical and symbolic. For the millions of racialized and enslaved people, colonialism is a physical and social death. They were not granted the dignity of being human and eligible for healthcare and living lives on their own terms and beliefs. And the enormous boat brought the long ago fathers and the long ago mothers of us all. The chains at his bottom of the boat. They brought you to a beautiful place, didn't they? What I find unsettling about the end of the world is played out in zombie movies is that the discussion, far too many narratives, that the state of exception makes people reach for what they already know. In The Walking Dead, the US police states is fired up again in episode one. Um, and this dearth of the imaginary is what Mark Fisher refers to when he says it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, and this is where I think we as artists and designers really need to step up our games in terms of expanding the imaginary, planting something else into that possible moment. Um, and make expanding the scope of what we can dream and consider as possible. The division, uh, episode two, explores the complexities of separation and difference in biology, politics, and in our very tools and ways of knowing, drawing on the ideas of Elizabeth Pavanelli who describes how the tenet of contemporary science emerges from creating a division between life and death. And that division is intellectual in the form of dialectics and dualism, so these binaries that we exist in, as well as in the membrane that gets created in biology and it gets said everything that's inside the membrane is life, everything that's outside the membrane is outside of life. Um, and of course, the border in geopolitical states. Life is only born when you can enclose yourself. Something can enclose itself. It can have self-referential, self-intentional action, grow, reproduce, and die. Her challenge to this way of thinking, based on her work with Indigenous Aboriginal people in Australia, is to ask where do we draw that line, that division? It's quite arbitrary, really, really. If we consider the cell, which, she, as she describes, you know, everything inside the cell is considered a unit, basic unit of life. But if we remove anything from within that wall, it no longer functions. It's no longer life. And how can that cell exist if there's no nothing outside of it to provide it with water, nutrition, oxygen? So it also can't exist in a vacuum. So this this line of like this is life is is completely kind of tenuous and renegotiable. And this is what for her, what she sees as the, the virus uh, as a kind of archetypal um, force. It refuses this distinction of life and death. This she stresses does not make it automatically emancipatory because it is a refusal to live by the current orders. But for the virus that manifests as the terrorist, the zombie, the climate crisis, it'll shake things up. Um, but the outcome is nonpartisan. That is, we have no idea what will come out of it or who will benefit from it, or if it will be emancipatory. Probably the rich will still be rich and will still come out better off. Um, and that the figure themselves is by definition always an outsider. There's no emancipation in being this, this that completely abject outsider. The third episode, the calculation, explores the ambiguous equations that are used by capitalism to define what is a valuable life worth saving and by ep epidemiology to save lives, and both of them at, often at the expense of other racialized lives. And these are ideas that have been explored uh, by Sadia Hartman, Catherine Yusuf, and of course, Ashil Mbembe, who provides the voice in this episode. Um, 
And they've all explored the racial calculus of quantifying human life as an expendable good. Um, these calculations date back again to the transatlantic slave trade. As I mentioned before, it was one of the biggest distributors of infectious disease. Enslaved people's lives were considered so expendable that an entire ship's people might die of yellow fever, among other diseases, while crossing the Atlantic. And this was considered a feasible risk. Um, there's a very famous case of De Soor, a Dutch slave ship, um, that was able to claim back insurance for the death of the enslaved people based on classifying them as goods, as things. Um, and this became the origins of life insurance. This is the sort of quantification of, of, of how our, our existence. Neoliberalism teaches us that every human life is a probability and the calculation of lives resembles the calculation of probabilities. In this calculation, the only thing that counts is efficiency. Life exists only to the extent that it can be spent to guarantee the survival of the many. Um, I mean, these sort of issues of quantification are so complicated and so ethically confounding. Um, I remember visiting uh, Henry at his office and they have this, what is, I can't remember what they call it now, but um, basically to, to screen people coming for sexually transmitted diseases test, you go through this questionnaire and they kind of, they basically profile you. Um, and in the Netherlands, this profiling is quite, um, uh, prejudice towards your sexual preferences and your race and your origins. And based on this profiling, they will give you a free test or they won't. Um, and through this profiling, they, they managed to obtain 99% of infectious diseases. Um, if they didn't have this profiling, they would not be able to test everybody. They would not be able to afford it. They would not be able to deal with the numbers of, of people testing. And a lot more people would suffer and, and not be able to get treatment. Um, so there's this real kind of weighing up these odds that I find really difficult to deal with. Um, uh, and I think that it's, it's one of those things where it's not that we are saying, okay, throw it away or get rid of it. Um, but it's understanding, you know, like it's, we don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater that um, epidemiology and statistical analysis is, has, does save a lot of lives and, and uh, distributes rights to people. But um, we have to understand that this is not the only way of existence, you know, that there is more to reality and that we can question the present dimension that we're existing to expand it, to get better, to get become less stigmatizing around it. Um, and is acknowledging that these sort of biopolitical measures or as Lembe calls them necropolitical because they quantify some people as being death worthy uh, are only 500 years old, they can be different. And this for me is maybe something uh, is an interesting space where, for horror movies, because there's something about horror movies that makes them exempt from uh, a lot of other social and cultural restrictions regarding taboos and implausibilities and exploring taboo and implausible social and cultural narratives, ethics and ways of, of being like they're, they're, they're a place where the kind of unimaginable and unacceptable can be explored in a kind of mythopoetic metaphorical way um, and possibly if we can explore them we can begin to advance different uh, ways of being from the cultural shadow to move beyond the capitalism as the world therefore the final episode is an invitation to hold space for a new way of being um, inspired by the words of uh, Christina Sharp um, to wake to the ongoing repercussions of colonialism um, and development that reduce life to economics, to wake as remembering the lives and times already ended, the apocalypses, the sacrifices, the pasts, uh, which if we do not remember, we cannot dismantle, and uh, wake as becoming conscious. Uh, to read Christina's words herself, uh, wakes are processes. Through them, we think about the dead, 
and about our relations to them. They are rituals through which to enact grief and memory. Wakes allow those among the living to mourn the passing of the dead through ritual. They are the watching of relatives and friends beside the body of the deceased from death to burial and the accompanying drinking, feasting and other observances are watching practiced as a religious observance. But wakes are also the track left on the water's surface by the ship, the disturbance caused by a body swimming, the one that is moved in water, the air currents behind a body in flight, a region of disturbed flow, in the line of sight of an observed object and something in the line of recoil of a gun. Finally, wake means being awake and also consciousness. And burn with eyes that see our souls walking, singing, yeah, building, mm -hmm, laughing, <laughs> learning, yes, loving, yes, teaching, mm -hmm, being. The wake opens the possibility of different modes of existence, which is why I find the return of the voodoo zombie really interesting. Uh, in my research, I also came across the Buddhist zombie, but not, I could not find a lot to go on there. But I think that we can find alternative manifestations of these figures. If we understand these figures as coming from what some people have called the anima mundus, which is a sort of imaginary realm of these symbolic archetypal um, figures, uh, that uh, is our collective unconscious, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got the dominant uh, narrative, which is coming from the West, but we can find other narratives that can kind of evolve our conscious narrative and, and evolve our understanding and our relationship to these archetypes. Um, and with the Buddhist zombie, as well as the, uh, the sort of voodoo zombie, they're not viral zombies. Um, that shake things up but are never invited in, as Elizabeth Pavanelli warns against. They're, they're, they're zombies of our souls that we kind of relate to, that we kind of become familiars with us and that we walk with us kind of thing. Um, and we are learning that human life is not only far more entangled with microbial life than we ever imagined, but absolutely reliant on interdependence and diversity of all kinds on both political, microscopic and biomolecular scales. Scientifically, this is a new concept. Um, the language implications and practices of this paradigm shift aren't even fully clear yet, even to scientists. Um, and they are also therefore reaching out to work with artists and, and designers. And herein is also, I think, our opportunity. Maybe we weren't consulted when colonial science was started, but to imbue a new ethics and a new vision to, into science and, and understanding of it. What is clear is that the violent extractions, metaphors and practices of science and politics can only lead to humanity's desire, demise. But not knowing need not foreclose possibility need not foreclose our imagination. And that is what I will end with today. Fabulous, Nadine, thank you so much. It's so fascinating hearing you talk about the particularly about this project that you've done. And I'm I'm really interested in that. So this was like a really research heavy piece of work, right? Like, and your, I mean the final pieces contain a lot of like footage some that like you know you're very familiar with and some that's you know what what was it like going through that process with your collaborators did you have to vet some of the the like visual imagery with them or was it kind of like a two-way exchange um it was very collaborative and conversational I mean I did most of the sort of uh, sourcing and kind of proposing of, of things, but then it was constantly like interacting with Henry as well as interacting with the video editor and getting other input from other people and sort of seeing how things work and, and, and how, they, how they relate. Um, some of the stuff um, fell away in the process, other stuff added in, you know, it, it, you know it, it's kind of very organic in, in that sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Well, does any, has anyone got any questions for Nadine? Emily? Also a bit like uh, just what you said, Aggie, because there's so much like uh, found footage from films, etc. And also quite new films like from us, or, like, you know, like a many nice horror films. 
what do you do about because I often find myself finding the using these as references but wanted to put it into my work but to do with like copyright laws so I saw you in the end of the, your film I saw you referenced every single film you used and mm -hmm. is that then making it okay or do you need to actually ask for permission <laughs> Um, apparently, if it's shown in a gallery, um, it's okay because it's for educational purposes um, and there's no sort of commercial income. So it's kind of, it has a disclaimer at the end, it says it's for educational purposes, it's for research only, blah, blah, blah. Um, officially in the European law, as long as you don't take more than 30 seconds from one film, continuous film, it's fine. Um, I haven't, uh, this is also but this is also the reason why I haven't put it on YouTube is because I'm not entirely sure and I can't, have, don't have the money to pay someone to tell me for sure if it's okay. So I'm not taking any risks. But I've spoke, I spoke to a couple of other people who work with found footage and they said, you're finally in a gallery as soon as you go online, that's when things get dubious. That's when they can find you basically. Um, but uh, to constantly position it as research and for educational purposes and not to sell it. I just wondered because, for example, let's say um, you st someone wanted to acquire the work and actually buy it, then somehow it turns commercial, and then I guess it's a bit of a. Then, then I, I suppose they would it'd be up to them to find out if they can buy it and what the because then the problem becomes theirs, right? If they yeah. buy it. And it's super interesting always to figure out uh, how where the work sits, and I think it's super interesting to use found footage. It adds a lot to it. So, but but yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, there was one uh, essay that I came across that was also talking about sort of appropriated video clips as zombies, you know, sort of kind of recontextualized and living on outside of um, uh, outside of their context of, of something. I mean, you can also see memes and viruses as zombies, you know, sort of spreading and, and kind of infecting and evolving and, 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 and so on. Yeah, thank you. Super nice film, by the way, I loved it. Cool, thanks. Wonderful. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Uh, can I, is it me? <laughs> um, yeah, I was wondering because you spoke about the end of the world and then also like zombies and viruses. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be super scientific, but I'd love to know some of your like speculations of what the end of the world would look like and what that means because often when we speak about the end of the world it's just like the end of the human race not actually the end of the world um yeah yeah i mean i i, I don't really have any scientific speculations i think that's my point is that i don't think we really know what the end of the world is and the end of the world narrative at the moment that is so pervasive in the news media, but also in arts and design, you know, this sort of impending sense of the end, end of something, um, doesn't seem to be a literal end. It's more of a kind of an end of human anthropocentrism, maybe, if we're lucky. Um, it's not entirely clear what is ending. Um, and, you know, you've got a lot of uh, people that have written about the end of the world has happened at 500 years ago. You know, this is the kind of Franz Fanon, the Aim Sayer, they all sort of, you know, my world ended with slave ships kind of thing um, and uh, you know afrofuturism is kind of based on this notion that the biggest disasters have happened already there's already kind of survival in we're already in survival mode we're already in that sort of post-apocalypse dynamic um i watched the a not zombie movie over the weekend which i find terribly disturbing um don't look up i don't know if anyone has seen it I found this way more disturbing than any zombie movie I've seen, I must admit. <laughs> um, and of course, there you have a literal world ending because there's a meteorite. But yeah, this, this, this machine that, of, of capitalism and media and stupidity is just, just like so overwhelming. And, and it just felt really a little bit too close to the bone. Um, but zombies are, for me are not real. I don't have to be scared of them. But the don't look up, I found much more terrifying in that end of the world scenario. I can totally imagine that, you know, like this world that we're in being like, yeah, whatever. We can make a movie out of it. We can make a meme out of it. Any other questions for Nadine? Do you guys want to tell me your favorite zombie movies, maybe? 
Ooh, great question. <laughs> um, actually, it's it's not my favorite zombie movie. Even though I have to say that one that I saw, it is not a proper zombie movie. It's zombie movies more like a reflection about it. That is the um, Jim Jarmusch uh, one, which I found very interesting. Uh, like his take on on the whole, like, especially on the American idea of the zombie apocalypse and putting it in like cult movies, slasher and, and like funny way. But uh, my question would be like, going back to the virus, no? There was like, I, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, this thing that this virus was coming from a bat was like a big thing. Like this, this idea that the virus was having lives like this. And these like two theories, like the, is the virus coming from a lab or is the virus coming from a bat? And like, we couldn't understand what was scarier. If it was coming from a non-human thing that had infected the human, or if it was coming from human research, scientific research that had generated such a scary amount of consequences. So what I was, what I'm trying to ask here is like, um, what do you like? Do you think that we are bound to be more scared from like, and like this non-human origin, like from the otherness, or do we somehow also see because there was this microscopic part uh, in your presentation and in the movie, like that there is this invisible part of the virus. So do you think that part of the like the fear is coming from the fact that that kind of apocalypse is coming from like something that it's so other and, and unseen that we cannot uh, imagine where it's coming from? Definitely. I mean, I, um, I mean, part of the horror, the, the, the fear of, of the sort of the, this kind of open ended pandemic, like we don't know when it's going to end, we don't know where it's coming from, we don't have anyone to blame, we don't have a Brad Pitt hero, you know, this is part of the kind of terror of it um uh, that that gets created and then this kind of sense of like yeah is it either as you say the the coming from an animal or like this overwhelming humans versus nature that is wild and uncontrollable and we've been uh you know like we're just at the mercy of of nature that could just squash us at any moment which is the sort of quite sort of classical modernist fear of the sublime um or is it a kind of a fear of um uh of each other and and, and, and of, of a kind of really i mean for me that's almost like deep evil you know like where, where there is actually a human conspiracy behind this sort of thing which is even more disturbing than a kind of just a sort of sense of our own sort of existential sublime insignificance in the face of nature um but then you get you, you also get these kind of movies um that really kind of uh, uh don't like don't, don't 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 play with the conventions or don't stick within the conventions like um this 1985 one the return of the zombie the night of the zombies or something like that it was an italian movie and i mean the the the, the zombies just it, it just spreads it's just it's in the air everyone that just comes into contact becomes a zombie it's got no kind of sense of contact or anything you know so there's this real real sense and then it rains and gets into the gutter and you see it going into the rest of the city and you know there's a real sense of like at some point nothing is going to make sense anymore so this kind of complete senselessness um and therein i think is this kind of also this thing that elizabeth Pavanelli talks about that it's like this this notion of the virus it's at the basis of our structure of knowledge so if, you know once that structure disappears and there's this senselessness it just doesn't make sense like maybe that is the deepest horror that, that, that there's just no sense left it just absolutely it doesn't even have a na narrative anymore it just does whatever it feels like it you know kind of thing i found that really interesting that you mentioned this idea that like the that zombies could be a shell that we input our problems into like a hold all for problems so that the different mm -hmm. throughout time the zombies change because the problems have changed and um yeah i i found it really interesting that recently i was reading about how the the military have this 
uh, uh, simulation that's called CONOP 8888. I'm sure you've heard of it, where they uh, they train they train using zombie um, uh, scenarios. <laughs> but the the I it's like a it it sort of was written a little bit as a joke, but it's very very useful because in a way it's kind of like a fun way to engage yeah, yeah. the trainees <laughs> and I was just wondering whether you thought that it's like because in the one in one way the films are telling stories in a very particular way but obviously the military are using it to tell stories and then that get a very different outcome I mean do you think yeah, yeah. do you think zombies will forever remain relevant because they're changing and they can you know oh. that um I don't know what question I'm asking. But I just... <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, um, I think, um, I mean, I, I just noticed the black image behind you, which could also be a zombie already, um, <laughs> uh, sort of very ancient zombie. But um, I mean, it's a bit like the CDC using zombies to make people aware of public health, you know, it sort of creates this artificial fear. Um, and uh, I mean, um, Dalia Schweitzer goes into much more detail about how Ebola, especially was the fear around Ebola was drummed up and elaborated and exoticized and, and all how that also then feeds into zombie movies. Um, uh, and it kind of, yeah, it kind of evolves with, with the thing and the sense that it emerges exactly acts with the, 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 the transatlantic slave trade also makes it a, it's a, a monster of modernity. So as long as the, the existence of modernity and the issues of modernity remain, it can continue to evolve and, and, and shape to according to different um, things. But you do have this real phenomenon at the moment where zombies are almost becoming cutesified. You get baby grows with zombies. They're, no longer, they're starting to no longer be horror figures. Mm. Um, and I think that actually that's, that's something that I think that Henry and I were really banking on that, oh, people aren't scared of zombies anymore, we can make this project, but people really still are scared of zombies. Um, so, you know, like a lot, we did also get a lot of people that were really shit scared by our film, which we were quite surprised by because we were so numbed by it by the time that we, <laughs> we were done by it. Um, so I think I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but to come to your, your back to your point of, um, I think we leave like maybe in the sense that you I think Carl Jung said something that you you get the um the forecast tool of your times maybe you could say something similar like you get the monster of your times or you get the zombie of your times mm -hmm. um that evolves with with what the, what a society needs or, or wants So there have been some really interesting zombie yeah. movies written in the chat. So yeah, Lindsay and Veronica, do you want to explain the ones that you think were relevant? I wrote a kind of not really movies, or, but uh, the book Parasitology, I think is a really interesting take because it gets, definitely talks about like capitalism and our need for like implants and medical devices um, where like tapeworms then take over your brain potentially. Um, but also there's like this anime manga called The Promised Neverland where like there's these monsters that you find out are like the evolution of bacteria that just take on different traits of the DNA of the organisms it eats and it wants to eat really smart children because if it doesn't it becomes mindless and like can't function so it has like it's a very interesting take on a zombie that we don't often see. I think there's actually a theory of evolution that we come our consciousness comes from viruses. Yeah, 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 it builds off that theory and then takes it like this creepy zombie children farming direction. Wow. Cool. Uh, trying to design is great also. Um... So the thing is, is this like an ongoing, do you think you will add to your films? Are there going to be more parts coming or no? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I wouldn't mind. Um, uh, but I'm also kind of, you know, my mind is like, oh, now I'm into something else, oh, now I'm into something else, uh, you know, like, there, I think I have a couple of projects that are just always kind of a little bit simmering on the, on the back burner and this has become one of them. Um, but I definitely, I mean, I can't, like, oh, zombie movie, got to see that now, you know, it's going to become a, a thing where I have to keep up with the, the move and the evolution of, of, of things, um, of zombies.
And were you a horror fan before or is this something that arose specifically because of the research questions? Um, no, I mean, I, I was a horror movie uh, fan before. Um, and actually, I think one of the first horror movies I watched was zombies movies that I wasn't that into that at that stage. But um, I became really into, to, to, I think I, I really got into Japanese horror originally first. There was so kind of balletic, uh, it, no, it was the Korean ones with the sort of really a sort of amazing, like kind of blood that looks like paint or something. It's like really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Japanese horror, that's the sort of slow, really kind of psychological horror. Um, and then um, through that, I kind of um, got more into kind of um, the kind of horror tropes and, and how they represent, um, yeah, always different um, fears or expressions of, of that, that that a society or culture were holding. I remember seeing a talk by Rosie Bray Dutty, like uh, quite formatively when I was in my twenties, who was talking about um, science fiction and horror movies as being a kind of a projection of the unrealized aspect of society or culture. Um, and, and therefore, you know, so, so horror movies being, as I said earlier, this sort of space where something that cannot be talked about explicitly or publicly or acknowledged can become expressed. Um, uh, and in that way, I mean, I, I, I also, as part of this uh, sort of research into the impact of stories, also got into Carl Jung and Marie, uh, Marie Louise van Brandt, who writes a lot about fairy tales and the Brothers Grimm. And you know, if you look at the history of fairy tales, they were really violent and horrific. Um, and in some ways, and these fairy tales were kind of um, are all uh, tales that be became tools for psychology, they became tools for social commentary. Um, and in some ways, I wonder if horror movies, because they were kind of existed for a very long time in this B grade cinema where things, different things could happen beyond sort of social norms, they've, they've started playing out uh, some of those, those aspects um, that fairy tales used to, to play. Mm. Great, have we got any any final questions or or I can see everyone's still chatting about great. <laughs> the kingdom I also love, it's really great. I just I wanted know. to ask, uh, what's your favorite zombie movie? Um, I really love, um, oh, no, I've gone black on his name, um, the radio show one. Do you remember its name? Um, 24. Um, it's uh, that was really good. Yeah, it's really clever. Uh, I think I, I don't think you ever see a zombie. It's just a whole bunch of people like ray, uh, hold up inside a radio show, um, and the DJ is kind of trying to keep people connected and tell them what's going on. Um, and you, you hear the zombies from the outside, and then oh, you, one person. Well, I don't know if I want to spoil it, but um, you, it, the the way the zombiness is spread is really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a, it's a very clever one. Nice. What was it called again? Sorry. Uh, Ponty Pool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, well, thank you so much for your time and your wonderful talk and, uh, and um, sharing your film with us. So it's been really great having you and chatting in depth about zombies. <laughs> yeah. so I'm very curious things. about you guys and what projects you're doing also and so on. Yeah, well, actually, we'll, we're going to be having a, an, a crit. So if okay. you are interested in attending later on, I'll send you the dates and, and times. Um, so it'd be wonderful if you fancy joining us or it'll be published online later on. Super. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Nadine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.